stand here and be my friend when I was looking at my computer. Have you ever seen a computer before? <coughs> you don't come to my room, do you? My secret room. Do you want to have us play on the computer, Harry? Hmm? I want to make a story. All right, let's make a story then, shall we? Yeah. Shall I turn it on and we'll make a story? Yeah. Okay. Watch it. Mm. story of women's complicity, their inability to break free. It's about how women collude with old patterns of feminine behaviour which encircle and limit them. Matilda longed for her parents to be good and loving and understanding and honourable and intelligent. The fact that there were none of these things was something she had to put up with. It wasn't easy to do so, but the new game she had invented of punishing one or both of them each time they were beastly to her made her life more or less bearable. Being very small and very young, the only power Matilda had over anyone in her family was brain power. For sheer cleverness, she could run rings around them, around them all. But the fact remained that any five-year-old girl in any, any family was always obliged to do as she was told. Matilda isn't the only five-year-old to discover the pressure on girls to do as they're told. But her early rebellion is the stuff of fantasy. Most of us are still more concerned about doing what we're told and winning approval than with setting the world alight. And many of us bury our own needs and identities as we're driven along by a very female desire to please others. Why is it that these old patterns of female behavior turned out to be so much more difficult to change than we imagined in the euphoria of feminism? We live with the myth of the confident, have-it-all women of the 30-something generation. But behind that facade, these women are still beckoned by ancient forces. The four women in this film are only just awakening to the fact that much of their lives has been complicit. They've sought approval rather than challenge the expectations and men in their lives. Now they're trying to unlock the secrets of their childhood. They want to see where it all began. I think all my life I've been complicit. And, you know, you say to yourself, where did it start? Where did it come from? I don't know. I mean, I just think I have been quite desperate um, since I was a child. Childhood for Magda and her sister Eva was overshadowed by an uncertain quest for their mother's approval. child you you behave in a certain way and you, you you try and win love and approval which is the most important thing to you because all you really want is someone just to love you because you're you Mommy. Yes, Mama. it starts up a pattern and really a pattern of complicity a pattern of doing things always for other people. And you're dominated by fear and by need of approval. Fear that you might 
make the same mistakes and just not feeling that you're loved and then you that transfers that certainly for me that transferred itself to my relationships with men <laughs> My mother's description of finding out of, of, of the time that she actually realised, in fact, that she was pregnant with me. And she said she was hoovering the stairs at the time. And she said she was so cross that she broke the hoover. And all of my life I've been brought up with this feeling that I really wasn't wanted. And that my mother was so upset at the fact that she broke the hoover. I think my mother has always tried to be the best she possibly could. And I think when she had children, she decided she wanted to be the best mother. It's part of her problem. It's part of what she's handed down to me that need to be the best. Childhood memories of my mother is just someone who was always very, very busy, usually cleaning or in the kitchen. And she never, she never used to sit down and play with us. She was really a very distant person. I couldn't ever really talk to her at all. And she'd never hugged us. Although now when I look at her and, and see how much she needs physical cuddles and love, I'm absolutely surprised that she, she never cuddled us at all. <laughs> explanation I can think of it is that she felt like I did when I had three small children she was just too tired she was just just terribly terribly tired in the first maybe 10 years of your marriage is there one image that you have of your married life yes always being pregnant and always trying to support my husband. I was brought up with the idea that a woman's role would be to support your husband in everything. And therefore, I, I typed his thesis, I cooked his meals, I looked after his well-being, I tried to keep my baby's quiet, just to keep him happy, which was really denying my own self. In my time, a man was something special. He was the breadwinner. He was the provider. And therefore, you had to please him. And even if you did not, actually feel elated uh, you pretended to be so that he wouldn't lose face one would not dare to say well you know you're not so perfect or so good that uh, would imply that he was no good perhaps at all they just couldn't take it I think the most complicit memory, if, if that's what you want to call it, of my childhood was this, this, this desperate begging sort of for approval from my mother. It wasn't enough to be good at school, but it was in the house. It was cleaning, waxing floors, polishing shoes, being her little angel. That came from being complicit. And just this feeling of, of, of desolation and desperation, of just wanting to be loved. And how do you remember your sister Magda? I suppose I remember her 
as someone who I always used to fight with or who was never very close to me. She was very distant. Um, I have more memories of her being distant as we were older. I don't have any memories of her at all as a young child. I, mean, I don't actually remember doing anything much with her or communicating with her till I was perhaps 10. Now I would call it I was just jealous of her. I always felt she was better than I was. She was far cleverer than I was. And I always wanted to be something special in my own right. And I felt she was taking away all of the limelight. And so I always wanted to do something that she couldn't do. And I could do much better than she could. And as a child, she could always do everything better than I could. So I suppose we used to fight a lot because I was jealous of her. And is there, was there anything that you could do better? No, nothing. Nothing at all. At least I can ride a horse now, she can't. <laughs> Complicity begins not with men, but in women's relationship with other women, especially with their mothers and sisters. Competition with other women and envy of other women are powerful forces in our lives. Sometimes these feelings drive us on to achieve. More often, they cripple us. We fear that we may not be loved unless we succeed, but we also dread that we may be annihilated by other women's envy if we do. These are women's impossible, unresolved, forbidden feelings. Sister. Well, I was going to say she's a wimp. I mean, she she was she was always the the feminine one and the the one who was weak and the one who was um, more feeble, I suppose. I mean, I used to throw temper tantrums and she'd go and sulk. I mean, she and I would fight, and then she'd um, if she heard my parents walking up the stairs, she'd burst into tears. Now, in fact, we've been fighting equally hard. I was just far too proud to cry. You know, I'd be damned if I was going to shed a tear. And so if my parents would walk in, she'd be crying. And I'd get, you know, beaten. So <laughs> she's quite manipulative, I think. Beneath the surface of women's ordinary lives and domestic routines, there can be turmoil. Children tread the difficult path to separate identity from their mothers, often overwhelmed by their mother's expectations. Two other sisters have different childhood memories, but they're no less preoccupied with how these experiences have affected their lives. Jilly and Janie are still trying to heal the wounds of their enforced separation when they were small children. Jilly was sent away to boarding school while Janie was kept at home with her mother. My mother was sent away by her mother and possibly her mother was sent away by her mother. I think I feel as though it, it comes down the line that there has been a, a pattern of children being sent away. I, I hate boarding schools. I think I don't see how they're allowed, really. And I couldn't, couldn't send my children to boarding school. Jilly is married with two children. She gave up her career as a solicitor to become a full-time mother. Personally, I think what I needed to do, I suppose, was heal the mother-child relationship. I, I think that was probably what was driving me, running me, and that was the sort of the path I had to follow, really.
a time when, if anybody asked me about my childhood, I always used to say that I had a happy childhood. I just have no idea that, you know, that I had, you know, that it was any different. And uh, when things became difficult in my marriage at the time, I started to investigate much more what, what in fact I did feel. Janie, divorced and remarried, has one son. She now works as an active birth teacher. The main memory where things started to really change, and what it seemed like a significant turning point, if you like, in my childhood, was when um, was actually when my sisters were sent away to boarding school. And over and over and over, I would sort of go back to that scene, and uh, and then it became more and more apparent to me that I really missed them a lot. I actually don't remember having ever learning that I was going to be sent away to school. I was just in school, and uh, I don't I don't think I was ever told that now we're going to be you know, we're going to put you in school and you're going to be there, and we, you won't see us again for a few months or something. I think that was part of the hurt of it. I can just remember a feeling of having been, been left and not knowing what was going on and feeling like there was no mummy, there was no daddy. I remember just dropping, you know, outside the school. I remember them standing there and leaving them there and then driving away without them. And. I think it was just very, very strange. I didn't know why we were leaving them there. I didn't know why I wasn't being sent as well. And I didn't, I think I was too small to really have any words, you know, to ask. I didn't know how to ask. So imagine that someone has a piece of string on your tailbone and they're drawing it along the floor to help you lengthen in your lower back. Take a big deep breath. Take a big deep breath in through your nose and breathe all the way out through your mouth. And if that's very easy so far, you can you can drop down onto your elbows. As a child, you aren't able to express your feelings, or you you start. I, I, you start to feel that it's not safe to say I'm angry about such and such or I'm sad about whatever or I'm hurt about whatever. That very often you start to think that, that those feelings aren't okay. And uh, especially the angry ones, because most children are not told it's okay to hate somebody and to love somebody. And so when you do hate your mother or whatever, you very often can feel that there's something really nasty about you then out of that, I spend a lot of time trying to be nice and trying to please people. And I would nearly, I was very often not spontaneous, you know, I would work out, it was like an editor would come in inside me and say, no, don't say that. I was uh, 14, I think going on 15. I was totally unaware. I mean, we were Catholic, we were a model family. It was, divorce was something that was totally, totally impossible. When my father told my older brother and I, it was just, I mean, it was just, it was just not real. I mean, it, it was impossible. It was just something that was like a bad fairy tale. <laughs> husband said to me, really, I've had enough of our marriage. And I thought, um, 
Well, other people have affairs. Why should I not try? It was a revelation. It was like wonderful stars and whatever in the, in the sky and, and, you know, sex was something else. And so this sort of very strange situation happened where we were staying with my mother and this lover of hers. And, and the sex issue was, was, was there. I mean, you know, they talked about it a lot and, you know, it was very distressing um, to, to hear them making love if you're sleeping in the next bedroom. I was 13 when my mother left us. There was one night where I had a dream or a nightmare of my, me waking up and sitting up as I used to every day, just looking out of the window into the garden. And as I looked down onto the paving stones, there was a man looking up and laughing at me. And he started to climb up, and he was climbing up, climbing up. So I, as he sort of approached my window, I leapt underneath my bed covers. And the last sensation was a feeling of him leaping onto my bed. It was all discussed. My mother discussed sex with me. The whole thing was in the open. But there are a lot of mixed messages still from her. You know, on the one hand, she would then say, we well, must never get married and, and sleep with one person. And on the other hand, she'd say, well, hmm, I don't know how you do it, though. You know, and that this whole, you know, yes, you're still really a whore, basically, if you st sleep with more than one man. But on the other hand, no, 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 you must sleep with more than one man. So I think she was still very confused, really, in her own mind. How was it that all these years I could live without actually questioning the validity of what I was taught? How could I possibly accept serfdom? But there you are. For 20 years, I had excruciating migraines, which disappeared the minute I left my husband. I've never had a migraine since. My mother, I didn't let her in, as an adolescent especially. I mean, I suppose that's fairly common. I, I really rebelled against her. I had my period. I, uh, I wanted to hide that from her too. But I didn't want to communicate with her about them, and I hid my sanitary towels, and I used to burn them in secret in the cooker at home. And I remember my sister um, hiding them, wrapping them up in laboratory paper, and hiding them in a drawer because we didn't just. Somehow, couldn't accept that she would accept that that was a part of us or something. I'm not sure, really. I feel I feel um, really quite strange talking about that. Um, anything to do with sexuality or my puberty, because it was a really quite a taboo topic. And, and I, I just feel strange, actually, even sort of discussing it, really. And do you feel that you really can't talk about it now, either? Yeah. yeah. Some of the hidden, the suppressed anger from boarding school um, really came out, as it will, I suppose, in adolescence, and I was horrible to her. And with that feeling of anger towards her, this feeling of having been betrayed, really, um, by her, she, she hadn't been there for me, I felt. And there were definitely times when I just felt so unable to deal with hating my mother for 
sending my for my sister's going away i definitely went through the times of blaming her i think i think i started to think i was really quite a nasty person and when did you get married when i was 16. I was insecure as a very young child, perhaps because I was one of five children, so you're all vying for attention. So it's not unrealistic to, to want to be somebody special and, and to be the only one. And by marrying someone, you become, you know, the center point, your wedding day. You are the most important person there. So, yes, you could argue that that was the reason why I got married. 